to the stage as he brings this morning's lesson. So today, and this doesn't happen every week, happens a lot of weeks, but today, you know what, I was just so excited to come to church. Remember a number of months ago, maybe even last year, we actually did a sermon series called I Love Sundays. Anybody here for that? Anybody remember that or did we sleep through it? Six weeks, so it's hard to miss. You know what I mean? But it was kind of like, I I just love getting together with God's people, being in God's house on Sunday, hearing God's word, worshiping with God's, like it's just, I love doing it. And, uh, and so today, I just kind of had one of those, I love Sundays uh, moments. So, uh, so that's where I'm coming from. And, uh, you know, sometimes I get up and, and I say to Carolyn, I don't want to go to church today. And she says, You're, you have to go, you're the pastor. And, you know, it, so it gets a little awkward, gets a little dicey. I'm, I'm completely joking, because you guys have probably heard that joke before. However, I am also really excited about this series, and uh, if you are so inclined and aren't doing anything, on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock, we have a small group, and it's here at the church, and we do dis- uh, sermon-based discussions on whatever sermons series we're going through, and so we just basically take that, that sermon, uh, kind of recap it, and then we usually go through a number, maybe 10 or 20 other verses in the Bible that apply, and we have great discussion, and we all learn from each other, and we all share and we pray for one another. It's a great time. And so I'd love to invite you uh, specifically this week, uh, if you're not doing anything, Thursdays at 7. Uh, there's some other small groups in the bulletin for you as well. Um, and I don't want to take too much time, but I do need to set this message up because, and I I'll just mention this now. I feel like I'm going to make both sides of people mad at me today. So there are, and so I'm just, just telling you, this is the way you're going to leave, okay? So get ready, okay? So there are those people who, uh, you know, are all into technology and love technology, and I have one of them sitting over here on my right. And uh, so they're just all about this whole technology and cell phones and iPads and yeah, you know, social media, everything. Uh, we're going we're gonna to cover that. But I'm actually going to make you mad today because I'm going to give you some things to live by that are biblical, all right? So get ready. You're going to be, going to be angry. Uh, and then there's some of you who, as well that are here and you say, why did I bother to come to church? I don't know what a Twitter is. I don't know what a Snapchat is. I don't care. Uh, all this stuff bugs the life out of me, you know, uh, and, and that's okay too. And you can leave mad and I'm okay with that as well. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just... Bringing this up, this is a bit of a taboo topic. I know it's taboo at our house. You know, Joe would always say, don't tell me about internet usage or, you know, how much I play my video games. You know, it's it's this whole thing that, you know, there's arguments over. Nobody wants to really talk about it. The the other thing is, and for for the other side, is that this is uh, an epidemic. This is global. This is happening. And we, as the church, better know where we stand And we also better have some strategies going forward. And so if you don't have understanding, then you're not relating to the culture, uh, to the place that God wants you to. Jesus' message was culturally relevant. Our message needs to be culturally relevant. D.L. Moody said, no preacher should get up behind the pulpit except with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in another. Because nothing worse than a preacher who has no clue as to what's going on and how that fits. All right, so that's my preface. My preface is everybody's going to be angry. So, you know, so just maybe get your anger on now. You know, ang- Bible says you can be angry. We talked about this, but don't sin. So I'm, I'm okay with that. Anyways, I have a little video, and we're going to set up this, uh, we're gonna set up this message today. And uh, we're going to set it up. It's, it's a minute long this hour. How many people have seen this hour has 22 minutes? Okay, so three of us, uh, five of us, okay, and so this is a little clip, and it's, it's actually a clip. I'll set it up because it's very short, but it's kind of cute and kind of clever, and it's, this hour has 22 minutes, and what they're doing is reenacting that end scene from, uh, from um, uh, Casablanca, the famous movie, right? So many of you will relate totally to the Casablanca, and then many of you will relate a lot to what they're saying. Uh, it's the whole, here's looking at you, kid, which is one of the most famous scenes in all of theater. So uh, check this out. Do we have audio before we start? It's only about a minute long. You're getting on that plane. I can't. I can't. Do you hear me? Not without my iPad. Last night you said I could. Last night we said a lot of things, but the world has changed. 
Now you're getting on that plane where you belong. No, I'm playing Candy Crush. I've been saving up my power candies for super combos. I can't leave without my iPad. I must have it. I have so many vacation pics to upload. And how are you going to log on to Instagram? That plane doesn't even have any Wi-Fi. You're saying that to make me go. I'm saying it because it's true. If you don't get on that plane, you're going to regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon, when the new iPhone comes out. They only have the five here. Well, what about us? We'll always have Facebook. <laughs> no, no. Here's looking at you, kid. Anyways, some of that might have gone over your head, and I downloaded that video, and it had subtitles before, because it's a little hard to understand, but uh, anyways, with the subtitles, it was, it was pretty good. So here's the way we're going to start this message. We're going to do two things, two exercises. If you do have a mobile device, if you don't, that's fine. You can actually just think about or pray for people, but if you have a mobile device, I'm going to invite you to take it out. I'm going to take it out right now. I know it's like, don't silence them in church and don't do that. Take out your mobile device, and now I want you to think of somebody. It just happens to be my brother's birthday today, and what I want you to do is I want you to, in the next two or three minutes, just message somebody. You can say everything from as simple as, hey, I'm thinking about you today. Hope your day is going well. Or, hey, I'm praying for you if you want to get spiritual. Or you could even say, hey, you know what? I'm at Highway Church. Where are you? You know, you could do one of those. Or, hey, why don't you come to church with me next week? So just, just there's somebody out there. It's my brother's birthday. I'm not going to do a birthday greeting right now, but I, I, will, I might do a birthday greeting a little bit later. But just, we're going to take, we're going to discipline ourselves. We're going to take two minutes, and we're going to connect to the outside world as we're sitting in here in church. So go ahead. I give you permission to do this. Told you half of you were going to be mad at me. The other half are like, oh my goodness, dopamine, I love this. And you're just getting all excited. But go ahead, take, take a couple minutes. Yeah, that's right. For those of you who are old school, this is a great opportunity just to pray. You can pray for kids. You can, uh, you know, you can uh, uh, think about or write down, hey, I meant to do that. I meant to, you know, I meant to connect with my nephew or I meant to connect with my grandson. I want to do that. All right. So just kind of mental note. Everybody just about done? Got to get those uh, thumbs working a little quicker. Okay. When everybody look at me when you're done. Okay, now here, here is something. This is the second part of this. If you have one of these devices, it took me a while. I had to get a YouTube tutorial for this. You can actually turn these off. You can actually turn... They do have an off button. Mine is on the left side. Some of yours is on the right side. So what you do is you push and hold. I have an alert there. But I'm going to push and hold. And then what happens is it says slide to power off. And so what I'm going to do is, you may have never done this with your phone before, I'm going to invite you to actually power off your device. All right? So I know you... <laughs> That's right. We need to pull up the YouTube. We're good? No, don't do it on there. We need, we need that one. <sighs> okay. So now we are completely distraction-free. And Jesus is watching if you didn't actually turn off your device. Like I said, I'm going to make everybody mad. I, I really feel like one of the subjects, especially in the church, that we don't talk about, and we talked about this one time last year, but I really believe there is a uh, topic, and it's this whole topic that deals with social media mobile devices, specifically pornography as it pertains to mobile devices, as well as personal computers, laptops, and such. And there are all of these issues, and again, I will just say bluntly and boldly, whether you like them or not, this is rampant, rampant statistics. I looked up some statistics today. In the year 2014, there were as many cell phones in this world as people right? Over 7 billion cell phones, which that was 2014. We are now embarking on 12 uh, billion cell phones in the world. And Dan has something to do with that. And we can talk about him, talk to him afterwards because he sells cell phones. However, let me, let me, just, let me just give you a little bit of history and, and, and we'll kind of bring you through. But I, I just, I want you to actually not get defensive about this. I want you to listen in about this. Because I believe God has a word for us today 
as it pertains to how technology is taking over our lives and how we can use technology to glorify him, to disperse the gospel, to use the gospel. All right, so that's where we're going to end up going. Put up this uh, ancient cell phone. Oh, you got the, we got the, okay, so this is the history of phones. Many of you will remember this top left, and many of you have never seen anything that looks like top left, but that's where, hey, that's where we came from. Uh, was it, Al, it was Alexander Graham Bell, it was, uh, it was 1486 or something, Alexander Graham Bell, he got the first, he won the first patent for the first telephone device that we know about. And so, like I said before, in 2014, all of a sudden we went from having one telephone, which was really useless because who would you call, right? But uh, so in 2014, we crossed the threshold point of now having more cell phones than people. And I don't know how that math works out because you would think all I need is one cell phone, but apparently people just need all kinds of cell phones. There's this famous story, Michael Dukakis, who actually ran for president. Uh, in 1988, Michael Dukakis was doing some work in the States, and he was going to a function. They picked him up in a limousine. It was 1988, if you can cast your mind back. And he got in the back of this limousine, and when he got in there with his wife, they were delighted to find that there was a car phone. There was this amazing thing, and you could actually make telephone calls from the back of a car. This was unheard of. This was, this was wild. This was just absolutely so, so novel. And so what did they do? They picked up the phone and started calling everybody they knew. 1988. I remember my dad had uh, an Impala, and I remember it was about 1988, and he got his first, remember those little antennas? And you could go, oh, they have a cell phone, because remember those squiggly antennas that were in the back? Many of you won't remember that. However, and do we have a picture of that amazing, is there a nice, big, fat phone? Yeah. For those of you who are carrying around iPhones, this is the original cell phone. Oh my goodness, how did these things ever catch on, right? You had to kind of lug it around like a briefcase. And uh, however, this is, this, these, are, these are the first cell phones. You would plug these into your car, and, uh, and this is just absolute, like this is a boat anchor, uh, you know, in my mind at this point, uh, especially compared to the small uh, cell phones that we have today. But Michael Dukakis in 1988 makes a phone call uh, as he's doing some governmental work, and it's so novel, 1988. Less than 10 years later, as his political career begins to emerge and he begins to grow and do things all around the world, he goes to the Ivory Coast, and as a delegate from the American government, he goes there to check out what they're doing because they're building fresh water wells in the remotest part of the world in the Ivory Coast in West Africa. And so he is literally there as a delegate from the government, and they're celebrating these freshwater wells, and it's a great day of celebration. And he's walking away because the, uh, the events have taken place, and as he's walking away, he's getting into a dugout canoe. Okay, so this is like the backside of the world. He's getting into a dugout canoe, and as he gets into the dugout canoe, as he gets into the dugout canoe, somebody pulls out a phone and hands him the phone because it was ringing and said, Washington has a question for you. And so in the span of less than 10 years, in his career path, he went from being uh, an executive this and that in a limousine and being all novel and the first cell phone he ever encountered in the back of a limousine to all of a sudden being on the other side of the world and being past this, uh, this, this cell phone. And it was literally, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, miles and miles and miles away, thousands and thousands of miles away. The development it's crazy. In my lifetime and in many of yours, we have literally seen mainframe computers, and I have a picture of that. This is the first computer in 1945, and it's coming, and there it is. There's a computer, and that's what a computer would look like. These are called mainframes. So we saw this complete uh, amazing thing happened where, where mainframe computers became desktop computers, and then desktop computers became laptop computers, and then laptop computers uh, became smartphones. And now it's amazing that the phone that you just powered off has more power than that wall of circuits and all of that stuff, because technology has grown. I wonder if the church has grown in the same way. I know the gospel is timeless, and I believe that. But what we're seeing here is, is acceleration in technology like the world has never seen before. 
we're literally seeing where the rate of acceler the, the rate of acceleration is accelerating. The rate of acceleration is accelerating. And where it took 100 years or whatever for you know, phones to take on to this point, now all of a sudden we see Michael Dukakis go from the back of a limo to the back of a canoe, and he can basically do the same exact thing. Technology is accelerating, and it could be an alarming rate if you want it to go down the fear road, or it could just be a thing that's happening that we could just understand and we could actually tie into because there's a power in it. And I believe the power can be used just as much for good as it can for evil. And so we've got to talk about evil in just a second. But I believe it can be used for good. Anybody know what the Arab Spring was? Put up your hand if you remember the Arab Spring. Okay, a few people. Okay, so 2011, let me help you out. 2011, three major governments were overthrown. Okay, in, in uh, Tunisia, the government was overthrown. In, in Egypt, 30 years of government was overthrown. In Syria, we've seen some of the ramifications of that. But in Libya as well, Muammar Gaddafi, and many of us would know that name, who was this dictator, uh, was overthrown. And the way they were overthrown was essentially two things, technologically, that were never available before. And so the Arab Spring, you can throw up a picture about the Arab Spring. So this is the Arab Spring. This is Tahrir Square, uh, Tahrir Square in Egypt. And this is the celebration after they uh, overthrew the government within a couple of weeks. Within a couple of weeks. And the way that they coordinated and the way that they got together and the way that they uh, you know, planned was via Facebook. They would get the word out via Facebook. And so, of course, Mubarak, like many of us, we think, well, let's squash this thing. Let's, you know, let's make sure it's not there, make sure it's not working. And so he shut down the internet. As soon as he shut down the internet, not just a section of the population was on board, the entire, the entire nation was on board because they thought this guy needs to go. And so then what he did was he turned the internet back on and tried to use it for his good, but by then it was too late and they overthrew him and he ran for his life. Muammar Gaddafi did not get out with his life. They killed him because of years of oppression and years of all kinds of stuff that we, we won't get into today. Let's go to the next little slide there. This is, this is a picture in Egypt of the Arab Spring. And if you just take a second and just count the cell phones and you know, you're going, man, I, I'm just against all this cell phone stuff and whatever. I, I'm just asking you to appreciate What's happening in your world? You may never have had a conversation about this. You'd be like, oh, I, I don't like technology. My mom was here. She'd be like, oh, I don't want to touch that stuff. And I'd be like, okay, cool. Just just, I'm just asking you to appreciate that governments are being overthrown. These are being tools that are used. And you can, you can again, play the one side of that. Well, this is a good thing because Mubarak had to go, or this is a bad thing, and stuff like Syria is happening. Since the Arab Spring, we've seen all kinds of unrest in Syria. What I'm asking you to do today as a Christian, as a believer, as somebody who follows a faith, to understand what's happening in your world, because things aren't changing. Things have changed. Things are different. You may not like it. You may not know about it. You may not agree with it. I'm telling you today, things have changed. Things have changed. Interestingly, I read, I read this book called um, Thank You for Being Late, and uh, it's written by a New York Times bestselling author, Thomas Friedman. He's a, a global market strategist. He does all this. He's a very, very smart guy, probably one of the smartest guys that I've ever read. And, uh, and he actually writes this book called Thank You for Being Late because he believes in this world of technology, this world of busyness, this world of laptops always open or iPads always on or cell phones in our hands. We never get a chance to actually take a breather. And so he, was, he would always go out and have lunch appointments for whatever. And he said, invariably, people would come in and they'd be like, oh, I'm so busy and I, I missed the train and the taxi was late and, da -da -da, and I had to send an email and they get all caught up in the rigors of life that they would get to him and when they got there, they would give this sob story about being so late. What he decided was to discipline himself in those moments to think, hey, I got a break here. I could actually just take a step back, do some mindful exercises, thank the Lord 
for all of his blessings in my life, including this little 15-minute segment where I don't have to open an iPad I don't have, or open a laptop. I don't have to answer an email. I don't have to respond to anybody. I have an appointment, and I'm going to step into that appointment in just a second. And I'm just, so he said, no, no, no. Thank you for being late. Thank you for being late. And so he kind of juxtaposes the two, uh, the two things. Number one, that you can actually control yourself and have a meaningful life even though all of this technology and all of this stuff is going on all around you. But in his book, he says these things, and I want you just to grasp this for a second. Many of you who are, are builders and from the builder generation, and uh, you know, no tycoons, uh, Henry Ford, uh, you know, Andrew Carnegie, who built buildings and they had all of this stuff and they were the, the big wigs of the time. Just, just, he wrote this, and I thought, this is so significant, and it just speaks to where we are today in our world, where you live out your faith. He says, Uber, and if you don't know that word, Uber is a taxi company. Uber is a taxi company. So I'll, I'll read the whole thing, and maybe we'll just go back. He goes, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Right? Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, which you might not know about, it's kind of like an Amazon, but it's somewhere else in the world, so we don't usually kind of go there. But Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. They have no inventory. And Airbnb, which is now the world's largest accommodation provider, more than Hilton or Best Western or any of these big companies that we know. Airbnb is the world's largest accommodation provider and owns no real estate. Like, I don't know about you, but I, I read through that and I'm like, what? How is that possible that a taxi company doesn't own any vehicles? Or how is it possible that a hotel chain doesn't own any real estate? And so it's this interconnectedness of the world where you just go onto your Uber app and ask somebody around to give you a ride to Toronto and all of a sudden they show up and you go there and it's all just happening. It's just happening all around us. It's the largest taxi company on the planet and they don't own a single car. Airbnb, same thing. We went on vacation last year. We looked into Airbnb. We found a place. We went up to Collingwood. We stayed at some, we don't even know who they were. We stayed there. We paid our money through PayPal and we left and we cleaned up and all that kind of stuff. We never met the people, whatever. It was the, we just got really, really good, cheap accommodation. And it was fantastic. It fit our family perfectly. Facebook, many of you are on Facebook and we have a Highway Church Facebook page and such. Uh, Facebook, if Facebook were a country, I don't know if you know this, but if Facebook were a country, it would be the largest country in the world. It, it basically is the largest collection of people in the world. What actually staggers the mind is that China does not have Facebook. So of the remaining 6 billion people, there's enough people in the population of Facebook to be the largest, the largest uh, country in the world. So, so why? Why is this? What, what, what is exactly happening? Because if you're like me and I'm like you and we hear this stuff, we feel like it's getting out of control. We understand that there's this acceleration, but why? Why is this actually happening? And I want to tell you this uh, little story and it will define it and then we'll go into some practical stuff. We'll go into the Bible and we'll go into some practical stuff. But there was a guy, there was a king who decided, and this is a fable, there was a king who decided that he wanted a, a, a specific type of game so that he could play with people and it could challenge his intellect and, and all of these things. And so there was a genius of a person who actually dis designed the game of chess. This is what they say, is the beginning of the game of chess. And so this person uh, designs this intricate game of chess with all these moving pieces that can all move different ways. And the king is delighted. He just loves this. He's just like absolutely mesmerized by this game. And he thinks, this is the best thing. He, he's like, I, I will give you whatever you want. And so the man who designs the game actually says, I would like food. I would like food for my family for the rest of my life. And he's like, okay, well, how much food is that? And he says, well, why don't we take one grain of rice? There's 64 spaces on a chessboard. Let's put one grain of rice and let's just double it for every square represented on the board. So the first square would be one, and the second square would be two, and then it would be four, and then it would be eight and 16 and so forth, and the, double the process. 
if you do that, you literally have, and I did the math kind of, 18 quintillion grains of rice, which is enough to cover India three feet deep. So smart guy creating the board, but smart guy also providing for his family. But don't miss the principle. The principle is this. There's something called exponential growth. And exponential growth is why acceleration, the rate of acceleration is accelerating. And that's the world you live in. And so there's this little graph that's right here, and this is why I think this is taboo, and this is why I think our church should be talking about it, and this is why I think we should actually have a conversation about it, because we are becoming irrelevant really, really quickly. And it's important we don't become irrelevant. I'm not willing to throw anything out. All I'm saying is, as a people, we need to understand this. We need to understand this. So so this is a graph that was actually made by a guy named uh, Eric Teller, And this is Eric Teller's graph. And so essentially what he shows at the bottom, this would be like bow and arrow down at the bottom. And then, you know, technology builds on technology, stands on technology shoulders. And all of a sudden you get a mainframe computer and then they condense that down and you get a microchip and they make that more efficient and more efficient and more efficient. And all of those efficiencies, all of those things build on each other until you get to the place where we are here. Two things I find scary about that. Number one, for the longest time, we could adapt. We were okay. We were, you know, okay, well, I got a phone. Well, he got a phone. Well, we got a TV. Yeah, we got, hey, we got a color TV. Okay, yeah, we're keeping a a VCR. We can watch movies in our home. Oh, my goodness. What's, you know, radios and all of these things. And so we're just kind of like, we're loving life because technology is actually helping us. Technology is actually entertaining us. It's, it's, It's feeding our souls. It's giving us family time. It's doing all of those things. And all of a sudden, there's this hockey stick moment where technology passes the rate of our ability to adapt and all of a sudden technology has left us in the dust and I think in many ways that's where we are so that's the first scary part is I think we are actually beyond where we should be adapting this second scary thing is and this is what I'll bring you back to the chessboard Most people who are global economists and all of this kind of stuff say we just basically crossed about halfway point on the chessboard. And if you look at this, because of the rate of acceleration and the way that everything is going to work, uh, it's just going to get faster and faster and things are going to change quicker and quicker and and it's going to be really, really hard to keep up personally, and it already is, but as a church, as Christian people, because there are things that are coming to bear, and that's what we're going to talk about in a second. We, we need this context. This is, a, this is something we're not talking about in the church. We're just happy. Let's just go to church, and let's just sing the songs, and listen to the messages, and let's just pretend like nothing is happening in the world. It is. It is. And I'm not telling you to scare you. I'm telling us all so that we can be aware. Let me go to the... There's a Second Chronicles passage of Scripture here, and I love this passage of Scripture. First Chronicles, thank you. Okay, so First Chronicles says this. There was the tribe of Issachar, and I'm praying that we as people will be like the tribe of Issachar that was in the Bible. From the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives, and all of these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. They knew the signs of the times. And I'm saying to us, we need to know the signs of the times. Let's go to the Daniel passage. Now, I want you to go home. This is your homework today. This is the last chapter of Daniel. Read the last chapter of Daniel, which, of course, all of this whole conversation leads us into the next step, which is the whole idea of prophecy. Well, when is Jesus going to come back? What does Jesus have to say about all this? Like, is Jesus just going to let this acceleration take place, or how does that all factor in? And this is what Daniel says, and this is... This is like 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years ago, he says these words, which if you overlay them over what I just said to you, make complete sense 2,500 years later. But you, Daniel, this is kind of the closing of the book, keep this prophecy a secret and seal up the book until the time of the end when many will rush here and there and knowledge will increase. You think about that? 200 or 2,500 years ago. 
And then recognize the idea of this word increase is this idea of exponential growth. And Daniel's like, I don't even know what exponential growth is. He goes, you know what? When the end is near, you're going to see an increase in knowledge. And we're at the point right now where you can pull out your phone. You've powered it off, but you could pull out your phone and look up a commentary on Daniel 12.4 right now as I sit here. Have you ever done that before where a pastor's preaching on something and I'm like, oh, I don't think that's right. And I'll just be sitting there and I'll be actually kind of researching while he's preaching. And we never had that before. But we could literally do that in today's day and age. The scary thing, if you want to be scared about this, and I'll get practical in just a second, the scary thing about this is that there are two other factors that are coming to play with the state of the world. And this is why, if I, was, if I wanted to, if I wanted to go old school, I would go, I believe Jesus is coming back very, very shortly. I believe Jesus is coming, he's returning very, very shortly because, because I believe that, it can, I don't think we can go a whole lot further. Maybe 50 years? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe 50 years, they, they say that there's this date in time where kind of like this graph that we've shown where, where computers who can think now and who can, we've got smart cars and cars can drive for us and we don't, even need to, we don't even need to drive anymore and they can do all of these things. There's a time where computers and the, the intelligence of computers, uh, artificial intelligence will surpass what even human uh, intelligence is and it will kind of mushroom from there. Knowledge will increase. Daniel warned us about that. We're living in it right here. But the reason I want, the reason I believe that Jesus is going to come back very, very shortly is because there's two other accelerations. Number one is the global market. Never before in the history of the world have the global markets been so tied together. And when the Antichrist comes, what is he going to do? He's going to rise up and he's going to take over the entirety of the global markets. And so if you look at it today, what happens in Greece affects us in U.S. and what happens in U.S. affects China. And then China's on the phone to Donald Trump and saying, hey, what's going on? You've got to change this. And then China says, well, we'll help you with North Korea. And then North Korea says, and then Syria's over there. And we're like, well, we used to send people there and we need oil. Okay, well, get your people out of here. We'll give it, Right? This is, this is where we live. This was not the way we lived when you were kids, many of you. Knowledge has increased. So as technology has done the hockey stick, global markets have done the hockey stick. And the second thing is, or the third, I guess the third part of this, is the environment. The environment is also hockey sticking, if you will, where we've heard all of the talk and global warming and climate change, and we had a really great February, <laughs> like I'm all for it. Uh, but ch the climate is changing, and so these three things, the, the, the volume of all of this change is getting just turned up to the place where it cannot be ignored any longer. And so I'm saying all that to say that as a church, I think this should not be a taboo topic I think this is something that we should be engaging conversation in, especially engaging conversation in the younger set. So I got about 12 minutes. Let me give you some things. I'm going to completely switch gears, completely switch gears, and I'm going to go down a super practical road. And this is something that I just want to share with you. And if you take it and you can use it and you can live by it and it can help you with regard to walking through your life and glorifying God in your technology, then so be it. There may be some kids in your life, there may be some grandkids in your life who they haven't even had a conversation about what to do uh, with regard to technology and how to handle that, that kind of stuff. And so I want to talk about three specific things. So you guys all ready for, you all ready for that? I told you you were going to be mad at me by the end of this. So the second part are going to be mad at me now. And all the other people are going to start amening. So, uh, so here, here let's, let's just get practical for a second. And I just want to quickly go through these. I want to address three things where it's so important, it's so vital as Christians that we can glorify God in these th three things that are taking over the world. And those three things are, number one, is social media. Social media is overtaking the world. It just is. Number two is pornography, because pornography is overtaking the, wor the world. You, you know, pornography, they used to say that pornography was the biggest thing on the internet. They said that 75% of the internet was, was pornographic material. 
And so I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what I heard. But the idea is I said social media first because social media has overtaken pornography as the number one thing that people do on the internet. So you got social media, then you got pornography. And then the third thing is if we're going to carry these devices around in our pockets and we're going to have them and we're going to be flipping them open every chance we get, every dull moment, every waking moment, we need to know how to handle them. We need to have, actually have some ground rules, and so that's what I want to talk about. And so let's just go through these really quickly. So social media, seven practical rules, and I have them listed here for you. You can write them down if you want. Um, so, and I just go through them, and I know it, I'm not supposed to, it's not really seeker-sensitive to say don't. I should have said do, but I, they just came out like this. Anyways, number one is don't covet. You know, if you're on Facebook, and for those of you who are not, uh, you know, don't go on social media, um, just, just hang on for a second, and we're going to loop back around. But uh, if you are on social media, this is one of the hardest things to overcome is, is coveting, because you're coveting people. Well, how come they have so many friends? Or how come they have so many followers? Or how come their platform is so big? Or they have a business in this. Well, how come their business is going really well in this? And you start to kind of covet. And isn't one of the Ten Commandments not to covet? Well, Facebook is a coveting machine, so when you open up Facebook, you need to have the, the armor of God on where you're just like, I'm just going to observe. I'm not going to kind of step into this, but I'm just going to observe. You have to not covet. You have to actually make a conscious decision when you see other people succeeding or other people doing things that you're not coveting. And we're going to talk about that in, in comparison in a second. But the, the second thing is this, don't vent. Please don't vent. Anybody have the friend that vents? Nobody has the friend who vents. I have a number of friends who vent. It's awful. One time I had to watch, it's like watching a train crash. I watched a 55-year-old man have a debate on Facebook with a 13-year-old kid and get schooled. And it's just awful. Like It's just like when you got all your opinions out there and you're ranting and raving, it never comes out the way you want it to. Don't vent. Don't do it. Private message, telephone call, sit down with coffee. That's the way you handle problems. You don't vent on Facebook. Number three is don't compare. I love this line. It's, I've heard it many times. I'll just steal it and use it. Don't compare someone else's highlight reel with your reality. And oftentimes you'll see people off in the Bermudas or, you know, they'll be in the Bahamas, Bermudas, in Bermuda, the Bahamas, or they'll be in Hawaii and stuff, and you're like sitting there and you're sick, you got a fever of 104, and you're like, what is wrong with my life? I see them and they get to go to Hawaii. I've never been to Hawaii before. And you start to compare and you're like, what is wrong with me? And you shut your computer down and you're filled with this almost sick feeling because you feel like you don't amount to anything. Meanwhile, they saved up for 20 years to go to Hawaii. You know, you don't know the backstory. Don't compare yourself. This, the fourth thing is don't waste your time. They say the new statistics are 3.5 hours on social media per day. 3.5. Now, if, if it were me, I'm like, well, that's not a bad statistic because they used to say that about TV. And I easily, when I was a kid, I watched at least three or four hours of TV a day. So it's not quite as bad. But here's the thing. When you go to social media, go with a purpose. Go with a purpose because you can, and you've probably been caught in it as well. You can get caught and all of a sudden you're there for two hours and you've been scrolling through and you've been talking to people, which is good. But you know, it, you, it, you can actually waste your life sitting in front of social media, responding to stuff. So don't waste your time. Number five is don't keep secrets. They say that one in five um, divorces now or one in five um, times of infidelity start on Facebook or social media. One in five. One in five. In divorce cases now, uh, lawyers are seeing Facebook come up one in three times. When there's a divorce happening, well, where did you, what happened? Oh, well, he met with her and da 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 Oh, and where did you meet? Oh, we met on Facebook and we started a conversation. One in three. One in three. You can't keep secrets. If you have a spouse, if you have kids, they can't keep secrets from you. There needs to be this level of openness so that you can have each other's back. You know why? Because you're going to go down the toilet if you allow secrets to be kept and just kind of live in this world where you think, you know, nobody else will ever find out. Let me emphasize the word to you. Social media. Social media. 
So, so important to get that in your head. Don't keep secrets. Number, number six is don't be distracted, and we're going to talk about that with devices in a second uh, with regard to distracted driving and texting is now beaten, uh, you know, drunk driving 100%, and more, more people are dying and having car accidents because they're texting and driving, so don't be distracted. But the distracted is this, and we all have those friends as well who have every alert that's going on their phone. Every notification comes up. So if you're a sports fan or if you're a gardener and it says, okay, it's time to plant your tomato seeds or whatever, all of these alerts are coming up. You'll have the news and the CNN will be bringing up alerts and your phone will buzz or bing or chime or chirp or do something and you're sitting down and you're trying to have a conversation with the person and their phone doesn't do anything but stop buzzing the entire time. Distractions. That's why you can't have carry on a, a civil conversation and have a good conversation don't be distracted. We're going to talk about it. Turn all of those things off. Again, you're trying to focus on something. Alerts will happen. People will start texting, and it's almost impossible to keep your focus. The seventh thing is this. Don't be a poor reflection of Christ, and I think this is the, the be-all and end-all, and both of, both of us. We, I know people who are Christian people who post things on Facebook, and I just, I shudder. It's not, I don't feel like it's my place sometimes to step in there, but I'm just like, how can you you know, everybody on your feed knows that you're a believer, and then you're posting X, Y, Z, and it might have been the greatest thing that you ever were involved in, but as you're involved in that, all of the people who you are connected with in a faith community are seeing this, but also all the people who, you're not, who are not connected to a faith community are seeing this, and they have these these thoughts of, hey, this is what a Christian looks like, and this is what a Christian lives like, and then they see your Facebook feed, and it's two separate things. You have to watch your reflection of Christ. Okay, so let's talk about pornography for a second. Let me just bring up this, uh, this scripture, uh, 2 Timothy 2.22. So I'm actually not even going to give you a list of things, because I think this is really easy to remember. And um, you know, they say that around 90 to 95% of men struggle with pornography. Uh, I will raise my hand to say that there was a time when I struggled with pornography, and uh, I did all of the steps that I'm about to tell you about and have overcome the struggle with the addiction of pornography. And so it is possible. It's not something that once it gets its hook into you, it's, you know, you're caught and you're stuck forever. But I want to just say that we can't, um, what's the word, just dismiss the fact that people are hooked on pornography that people are viewing pornography on a regular basis. And all of the studies, I mean, I don't even have time to go into all of the studies that say what a killer pornography is. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I would say that Satan's biggest tool right now is pornography. And so, and again, we don't talk about this in the church, and I don't know why, and that's why we're having this conversation, because I think, gosh, we could get up here and I could preach a message that you've all heard 20 times, or we could actually talk about something that's real and something that's happening in our lives. And this is the verse that I find freedom in when I think about pornography and involvement in pornography. Uh, this is Paul talking to Timothy, and incidentally, this is Paul's final letter, which doesn't really have a context, but it, this is a, a specific thing where Paul is at the end of his life, and he's kind of talking to and mentoring Timothy, and he says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue or run to righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. And enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. So as we go from this topic and as we kind of move on, I want you to recognize, and you can go to this, it's really easy, 2 Timothy 2.22, easy reference. You can look it up anytime. What did it say again? I don't know. I want to look at it. 2 Timothy 2.22. All you got to do is memorize the address. There's three things. Number one is you run from. you got to run from. Remember the story of Joseph? You know, the, the Potiphar's wife was all after him and all trying to seduce him and all da 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 And what did he do? He knew immediately, I know what i got to do. There's a strategy in my mind that when this situation takes place, I am going to run as far and as fast away from this as I possibly can. And so we have to run. We have to actually act in the moment. You can picture yourself visually fleeing or mentally fleeing. But the other thing f for this, and I will just say, men, you know what? This is what we did in our home uh, going back a number of years ago, is we had uh, an internet safety program that was on our computer, 
and my wife was the only one who had the password, and my wife was the only one who set all of the things, and it basically, we just deferred to her and just said, okay, well, it's, you know, <laughs> really the only one who can be trusted here, so we will just give you the keys to the kingdom, and you can do whatever you want. And so if you're a man in this room, I would su suggest and submit to you that that's probably the best step for you to take, because you, you just made the running really easy. You know what I'm saying? You made the running really easy. You're running away from temptation. You're removing all of those things that will tempt you. And then you run to, run to, and it doesn't matter what the issue is here because I'll, we have a hard time to run toward righteousness and run toward faith and run toward love and run toward specifically to run toward peace. And so, you know, there, there can be a hundred things that could cause us to run toward them. There could be any involvement. As men, and talking specifically to men because I think men have a harder time with this, a tougher time, but we need to run toward things that matter and things that have meaning and things that will bring life. And pornography is not one of those things. So run from pornography. Run to these things. And you can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. You know, one of the best small groups that I ever had was a men's small group where we, we started out. We branched off after that. We specifically, you know, nailed this whole idea of pornography. And we just, we just basically went through a big three or four books and we had each other's back and we f fell and we had hard times and da-da-da, but we walked through it. And this scripture verse says, you have to enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. You're not going to remain pure if you keep hanging out with the people who love this stuff, or who don't care, or who don't have any standards, it's just like anything else. So for those who are interested, uh, there is a, a, a software program called Covenant Eyes. It's not, it's not free. Most of these um, software packages are not free, but I would say um, that's a specifically Christian-based um, accountability software that you can install on your computer, on your phone, or on your tablet. And so I would say just investigate that. It's called Covenant Eyes out of Job, who said, I've made, my, I've made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon a woman lustfully. And so just check that out. There's another one called Triple X Church, which is great. has a lot of information on that site. And there's also, um, uh, there's also a thing that we used in our family. It was called the Canine, Canine Web Protection. It was kind of like this dog motif. So anyways... I can talk to you more about that, or you can research it on your own, but, um, you know, get that stuff um, on your computer, and, um, and you, will, you will be safe. Okay, and then the last thing is this, uh, devices and games. So studies are showing us, so Garrett, you're here, and you're representing sort of that uh, 13 and that age group and stuff, so we love you, buddy, but here's the deal about games uh, and, about, uh, and about devices. So we all, and you see this, actually show this picture. This is the picture of the girls at the baseball game. And so the, the guys who were announcing noticed the girls that were not watching the baseball game at all. And so they just kept on taking selfies and taking pictures of their pizza and updating their Facebook status and updating their Instagram status and da-da-da. And they just kept on, and this was the whole thing. And so they were following their, their feeds on their social media <laughs> networks. And so they were at a baseball game, but they weren't at a baseball game, if you know what I'm saying. And so the announcers noticed them and because they take, you know, shots of the crowd all the time. And then they panned away and they started talking about the game and they came back and they were still like this. And so these girls became internet famous for the fact that they were doing the entire game. They were doing exactly what they're doing. Eight uh, girls-ish there. And at one point or another, all of them are completely just on their phones and not in, their moment, not in the moment. So, so we see kids like this all the time. Garrett, kids who are doing this kind of thing are becoming less intelligent one of, the, one of the massive things is focus. Kids cannot focus anymore. And I don't know about you, but I feel like, and I've been engaging with technology for a while, I feel like my focus has gone. They say that, and I don't know if this is true, I'm just going to throw it out there. They say that the average focus or attention span of a person in the 21st century now is less than a goldfish. So a, gold, a goldfish is eight seconds. A gold, you know, can swim around the bowl and go, hey, I'm here. And then all of a sudden in eight seconds, it's a brand new bowl. And so, uh, you know, for humans, they're saying seven seconds. They're mapping it at seven seconds. And so it's because we are just constantly flipping through and something else grabs our attention. All these notifications are coming up. The, all of this, uh, the statistics are, say, are saying that staring at a screen for these long periods of time, involved in these kinds of things and gaming, uh, not only is leading to depression, 
uh, massive depression, but it's also leading to, uh, obviously, addiction and um, violence, and violence. And, uh, you know, it's like, get, o- get off the game, and then all of a sudden you see this person come out that you never knew existed. And so, uh, you know, the, the violence is, is insane. And so I have seven here as well um, with regard to devices. And uh, so this is it. So practical rules for devices and games. Number one, if you're on your device, have one conversation. So don't be texting somebody while you're talking to somebody. You know, have one conversation. That will help. Number two is turn off all notifications. If you're doing your homework uh, at home and uh, there's constant texting coming and there's constant this and constant that and a news report and an update and a this and that, you're never going to focus on your homework. Um, number three is make a scheduled time t- so you can limit use. So this happens with games. Just like anything else, you schedule, I'm going to do this from here to here. With games, do the same thing. Enjoy the game. The game has been made for your entertainment and they're usually pretty good. But say, I'm going to do it from here to here and then that's it. And numbers four is this, don't text and drive. And again, we already talked about this, that it's, this is just killing kids all over the world. Uh, number five, we talked about this in the other part, that there should be no secrets uh, in terms of your device and your, uh, your mo- mobile phone or your um, tablet or whatever. Uh, number six is, hey, guess what? Maybe pursue some other interests. You know, you can go hiking, you can canoe, you can learn an instrument, you can do all kinds of things that don't involve the device. When, as soon as you get in there, it's like this vortex that sucks you in and won't let you go. There are so many things that we can still explore. And so for those of you who are maybe feeling the nudge that you are um, gripped by your device or by any one of those things, I'm going to challenge you. And the simple challenge would be to unplug for one hour a day. And that doesn't mean, well, I'm just going to throw it away and just do whatever. No, I'm, I'm actually challenging you to turn your phone off like we just did. You learned how to power it down today. So you can power down the phone and you can go do something intentionally. The other day, I'll tell you this, this one little testimony. The other day I was, at, uh, I was at church and it had been a long day and I did a lot of research and stuff like that. And I came home and I wasn't really super tired physically, but mentally I was just exhausted. And the mental exhaustion wasn't this kind of like, I just need to lay down and have a sleep. It wasn't that. It was just this headache. It was just my brain was, was buzzing. Anybody ever have that? And your brain is just like anxiety or something. And, and I, I literally, because my wife is a walker, I got I to gotta keep up with my wife. She's always walking. So I, you know, I'm driving home and I'm trying to get, I get rid of this headache. And I know that I, if I just get some air and go for a walk, the headache will go away. And sure enough, you know what? All I needed to do was just go out for a walk with my wife. And with 40 minutes later, I got some air in my lungs, got some air in my, um, in my head. And all of a sudden, the headache just completely went away. And so this is so, so important to know you know, that, hey, all this stuff's taken over the world, but we can control it. We can be the masters of it. And then let me read this last scripture. If you're going to live by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love and joy and peace, patience, which would go to, uh, you know, video games and those kinds of things, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Gentleness and self-control, and that's what I'm trying to get at, is that these things are ubiquitous. They're taking over the world. There's all kinds of advancements. There's great stuff that we can do. We can connect with grandkids. We can do all kinds of amazing things with these things, but we need to be self-controlled, and we need to let the Lord be the Lord of our technology as much as he's the Lord of our own heart. Amen? Amen. I know it's been a bit of a run-on sentence, but let me just end with this one last thought, and then we'll pray. Um, the year was 1468. 1468. Johannes Gutenberg, Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press. The printing press. The first thing Johannes Gutenberg printed was the Bible. This began what is known now as, we look back on, because it created exponential growth that the world had never seen before. Not everybody could have a Bible. This was, this was crazy. You mean I, I can own, I can hold, I, I can actually read and think about the Bible and all kinds of other books that were printed on this printing press? It changed the course of history 
We look back on it, and now we call it the Reformation, where the world was literally reformed. We are literally sitting in and, and taking part of technology that was based in that one move. I preached a sermon about three or four years ago, and I said, could it be that we're standing on the precipice of a brand new Reformation? And I don't think we're standing on the precipice of it anymore. I think we're like waist deep in this stuff. And so my thought is, my thought is, is if Gutenberg can use the printing press to print Bibles and they go around the world so that the Bible is the number one best-selling book in the world, we as Christian believers, we as faith-based community can use technology, whatever it is, can use technological advance, advancement for whatever it is, and embrace it and let it glorify God until Jesus comes back. And I think that's the stance that we should have on a topic that we're not talking about too much. You with me? Amen. Let's pray. God, these are challenging times. These are unprecedented times. No one in this room has lived through the kind of change that we're living through in our day and age. Lord, technology has literally gone past the point of us adapting to it. And uh, Lord, we still believe in the eternal truths of Christ and his lordship. We still believe in the eternal truth of the word of God. We still believe in all of those. Nothing in that has changed. But God, our application has dramatically changed because the world has changed. And so I pray that you would help us, Lord, to glorify you in our internet use, that you, we, you would help us glorify you, Lord, with the use of our devices. And Lord, that we could take these things and Lord, that we could use all of this technology for your glorification and for the good of humankind. So help us do that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.